Good morning and a very warm welcome to Breakfast with Arab. It's really good to see you all here. I um, hope you all had a good summer and are feeling suitably refreshed. And a special welcome to our new clients, especially Bridget Nichols, who's somewhere here with us. Morning, Bridget. Okay, and so to our speaker, Graham. Graham Aldwinkle started sailing when he was eight. And as a young boy, he was particularly interested in the appliance of science, which is why he always loved sailing as he had to think about what the wind was doing and how to make the best use of it. Studying a mixture of physics, maths and chemistry, as well as languages, Graham set off to Oxford University to study engineering science. Graduating with a master's in 1994, Graham joined Arup. Asking Graham what drew him <coughs> to the firm, he responded, Arup was the practice everyone wanted to join. This was the first job application he submitted. It is the only interview he has ever sat. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny too. <laughs> Since 1994, Graham has been immersed within Buildings London Group. Over the years, he has worked in our Seattle office, working on the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation headquarters, and he has also worked on the engineering designs for tall towers in seismic zones. Returning to London in 2010, Graham has worked on an array of commercial, residential and mixed-use developments, including the Leadenhall Building, One New Change, Sagrada Familia and HSBC Tower at Canary Wharf. In recent years, Graham has also been steering the digital agenda for multidisciplinary design teams. Graham's passion remains sailing. He shared with me a few anecdotal stories about being featured in the Telegraph as part of a regatta he raced in in 2002. And he was also a national champion in a keelboat class in 2006. And just last summer, Graham sailed a 50-foot yacht from England to Spain over five days alongside dolphins and whales. Graham has been fun and funny to work with as we prepared this talk, and he really is quite the gentleman. So I really am very happy to introduce the especially lovely Graham Oldwinkle. Thank you, Farah, for that in lovely introduction. And good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for coming this morning. Learning, unlearning, and relearning is an everyday phenomenon of modern day life. We have all had to learn about technology that we never knew we needed to know about. Remember navigating your first smartphone or realizing that GPS would overtake map reading. The advancement of technology will continue to unfurl. My provocation this morning is that we must understand better the advent of the digital age. Whilst I acknowledge this 21st century conundrum, I would like to share a few lessons from our recent history to start with. In 1962, the Mariner 1 <coughs> spacecraft took off on a mission to Venus. It barely made it out of Cape Canaveral when a software coding error caused the rocket to veer dangerously off course. NASA engineers on the ground issued a self-destruct button or command. A review board later determined that the omission of a hyphen in the coded computer instructions allowed the transmission of incorrect guidance signals to the spacecraft. The cost for the rocket was reportedly more than $18 million at the time. In 1996, Ariane 5 Flight 501 was Europe's newest unmanned satellite launching rocket, which reused working software from its predecessor, Ariane 4. Unfortunately, the Ariane 5's faster engines exploited a bug that was not found in previous models. Less than a minute into its maiden flight, the rocket's engineers hit the self-destruct button following multiple computer failures. In essence, the software had tried to cram a 64-bit number into a 16-bit space, which crashed both the primary and the backup computers. The Ariane 5 had cost nearly $8 billion to develop and was carrying a $500 million payload when it exploded. One more. In 1998, <laughs> there are more, no, just one here. NASA's Mars Climate Orbiter spacecraft was ultimately lost in space. 
Although the failure bemused engineers for some time, it was revealed that a subcontractor on the engineering team failed to make a simple conversion from English units to metric. This lapse set the, uh, sent the $125 million craft fatally close to Mars's surface uh, after attempting to stabilize its orbit. What do these stories have in common? As Einstein might have said of this, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Was too much reliance placed on the software? Or perhaps they rushed the checking? Who knows? Now, we're all here as professionals in our field. Many of us are construction professionals, learning both through education and on the job training. Yet how literate are we in our chosen field with new technology and new processes? Are these new technologies really giving us the answers we crave and expect? And do they provide the panacea to all our challenges as we design and construct? As professionals, from clients to engineers to facility managers, we have a responsibility to know what we are doing with technology. And as new technology comes along, or new ways of working, or new analysis methods, we are expected to maintain our skills and knowledge to be at the forefront of this. Yet we know the reality. Are we all expected to become experts in every new technology as it evolves? Alvin Toffler, a futurist from the last century, said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those that can't read or write. It will be those that can't learn, unlearn, and relearn. I will this morning take you on a, a journey of my view of life as a structural engineer and taking a cue from Alvin what this statement means to me. Alvin published a book called Future Shock in 1970, and it's so relevant to today's world that it has never actually been out of print. In fact, he coined the phrase information overload in it, and that's still highly relevant today. Now, as a breed, structural engineers can sometimes be perceived to be slightly risk averse. Things fall down if we or the builders get it wrong. Now, I prefer to think of it as the fact that we have a duty to society to get it right. Engineering principles have been around for centuries, and we just reuse those, don't we? Yet the way we use those engineering principles changes regularly. We are constantly having to learn new methods, new codes, new tools, new processes, new software, and all because new technologies are introduced. As Alvin also said, our technological powers increase, but the side effects and the potential hazards also escalate. Now on to classic structural failures. <laughs> in the 1970s, the Hartford Civic Center was designed and built in Connecticut, USA. The designer had purchased a state-of-the-art new software program to design the large span roof over the 10,000-seat arena. The roof was meant to be supported on just four pylons in the corners. Five years after the center opened, with heavy snow, yet less than half the design load, the roof collapsed. The investigation revealed a number of assumptions made in the course of the design that were not borne out by what happened on site during construction. The roof deflected twice that which it was meant to theoretically. Yet the designers assumed the simplifying assumptions they had made in their analysis was the cause and that all was well. The investigation found that the designers also over relied on the use of this software. Fundamental design and constructability issues and skills were overlooked in the pursuit of their efficiency savings from using this new tool. So I asked myself this. Is the sophistication of modern technology and modern computer tools allowing us to analyze to a very detailed level beyond the capability of the tool or the user? By way of comparison, the Smithfield market here in London was designed and built in the late 1950s using little more than first principles and complex maths. Some of you may be familiar with its domed roof, just using a three-inch thick slab with a span of about two-thirds of that Hartford Civic Center. The engineers used shell theory. They used some computers to solve some tricky equations, and they validated by load testing at one in 12 scale model. Now, we're, we're currently looking at the refurbishment of this to extend its life having been amazed at the calculations that we drew out of our archives. Nowadays, if I say to a client that I want to do some load testing, I have to justify its cost 
and the value to a QS before it can proceed. We do need a number of tools in our armory to validate new methods and new tools. That includes physical models and tests. Now thinking back to my rocket stories, coding errors are actually well known and documented. The good news is that the profession is very good at breaking code down into bite-sized chunks to debug them. So why then do we constantly see updates to apps and programs labeled as bug fixes? Now, every one of us in this room will have installed an app or a software package and been presented with the end user license agreement. Most of us just click on I accept and move on, don't we? The wording of those end user license agreements is usually along the lines of a disclaimer. In no event shall the vendor be liable to you for any damages whatsoever caused out of your use of the tool or your inability to use the software. So what are we to do? We are responsible for knowing how to use it, we alone. My message so far is that we are constantly making use of new tools, updates, versions, apps, scripts, code, etc., that we're fundamentally relying on to do our daily work. Are we in danger of losing sight of the very core principles on which this profession was built as we learn, unlearn, and relearn? It's not just the construction profession, of course. As I've been a keen sailor longer than I have been an engineer, I have seen the trend to using GPS technology become so mainstream in sailing that it is now the accepted norm. You wouldn't go to sea without such technologies. In fact, GPS is embedded in, many, in so many global systems these days, not just shipping, that the risk of GPS failure is unimaginable. The downside to this is that the skills of dead reckoning or sextant use or triangulation are becoming lost on an increasing swathe of the sailing population. The US Navy recognized this in the late 1990s and in 2000 they reintroduced training on celestial navigation using the centuries old technology of the sextant. It remains to be seen whether the well publicized four collisions involving the US Navy in the last year had anything to do with their reliance on technology. The point is, relying on technological innovations do make sense, but only if we trust them. According to the 2017 KPMG Global Survey of CEOs across all industries, one third of CEOs believe their sector will see a major disruption in the coming three years as a result of technological innovations. 65% of CEOs see this as an opportunity, not a threat. I will now take you back into space. These space missions are one-offs. Huge investment is needed just for one mission. The price of failure is huge. The scale may be different, but this is not that dissimilar to our construction industry, where each project is unique. <laughs> what? I'll go home now. <laughs>
great engineers over the centuries. But just like the space industry, other industries' use of technology is changing the way we do things. Will engineering skills be eroded by new technologies, particularly artificial intelligence? You may recall Carolina Bartram touched on this in her talk in the year 2525, back in May. Will a driverless car be programmed to sacrifice the 10 pedestrians to save the one driver in an accident? Would Captain Sullenberger have relied on the computer to land on the Hudson River in 1999? Or indeed, would his passengers have expected him to do this or to have relied on the onboard computer? So are we really at risk of losing these core skills to innovative technology? I hope not, but let me give you two more examples from the construction industry of lost skills. Damascus steel was produced for centuries but ceased around 1750. Their legendary characteristics in included incredibly strong and sharp uh, steel used in swords. That skill to make it has been lost, partly because of different ingredients, partly because of mass production elsewhere. And it turns out they had a particular recipe that is still today eluding those who have tried. Another example, Roman concrete has survived underwater for centuries and millennia, in fact, thanks to the inclusion of volcanic ash, which is believed made it stronger when buried in seawater. Modern concrete using Portland cement cannot reach that level of longevity yet we're only now relearning about the ability of engineers of the past. Then let's not forget a more modern example, Google Translate. Will this now mean our thirst to learn a foreign language diminishes? Now in most industries, there is a gap between the graduates and the experienced leaders of about 40 years. I'm reminded that the graduates joining Arup this month start, uh, weren't even born when I started. The ever-increasing pace of technology will mean that what you learn at the beginning of your career will have massively changed by the time you retire. The skills gap between the traditional ways and the new digital ways is widening. This handing down of skills and knowledge to the next generation is therefore changing. We need to learn, unlearn and relearn, as Alvin said. We all need to learn new skills in a shorter and shorter cycles. It was 65 years between the Wright brothers' first flight to putting man on the moon. Those early pioneers would have had no idea where their inventions would have taken them over their careers. Yet now, with the pace of change, is it the experienced generation handing down their skills, or will it become the younger generation teaching the older ones? We must ensure all our innovations are equally understood and understandable to all generations. Well, one way to do this is to adopt the Maya principle in our new technologies. Maya, uh, coined by Raymond Lowy, a product designer from the last century, Maya means most advanced yet acceptable. In essence, it means the adult public's taste is not necessarily ready to accept the logical solutions to their requirements if the solution implies too vast a departure from what they have been conditioned to accepting as the norm. Apple applies this approach constantly, ever since their experience with the Apple Newton. That was a smart tablet introduced to the public in 1993. It didn't take off, partly because of the fact it was so different to what people had been used to before. Apple's iPod then worked because it had a good balance of buttons and ease of use, yet was a brilliant concept to replace the Walkman idea. It was the most advanced they thought users would accept, as each iPod design improved upon the last. Apple then combined the iPod style in a personal organizer and called it the iPhone, which instantly made it acceptable, yet it was highly advanced for its time. And the rest is history on the iPhone. When applied to the construction industry, Maya is a concept rarely acknowledged in the tools we use. We push the boundaries of what we do, guess suggesting parametric scripting or computational fluid dynamics to teams is as if they should know how to do it. Sometimes the tool is seen as a black box and is difficult to learn in a short pace of time. So how do we know we're getting acceptable and correct answers from these tools that we now use? We know because we're constantly checking them. We're looking at them against first principles and hand calculations and against other tools. We do not blindly believe the results. In Tristram Carfrey's 2014 Institution of Structural Engineers Gold Medal Address, Designing with Computers, he advocated using computers more, and I completely agree 
where used properly. We need to be analyzing and reanalyzing, searching for optimization ourselves with a little steer from algorithms. This gains us a fast appreciation of an idea so that we can iterate. And this is exactly what our architect friends do, of course. As Tristram said, Surely what we really want is the wise use of computer models, even early in the design process, and I agree. It's all about iteration to reach the solution. As Henry Ford said, if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you've always got. We won't progress otherwise. We have to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Yet that is exactly what you get with automation if you feed the same parameters in to answer the same question. Automation is not the only answer. It is a tool. Our work with the Sagrada Familia team have developed a solution that combines modern post-tension skills and techniques with traditional stone masonry skills. We have laboured over many iterations of the analysis models, making small adjustments each time to really interrogate and delve into, the, uh, into what's happening with that model and to refine it and to understand the intricacies of that design. This thinking has not only crafted a building true to Gaudi's ideals, but one that actually enables the team to build quicker, more cost-effectively, and with less material, meaning less weight on the existing foundations. With all of these stories, it is the training that is the fundamental answer to allow us to relearn. As an industry, we have to make sure we are training engineers in software use or coding, or as well as practicing the art of hand calculations from first principles. We also need to get our engineers on site more. They need to see buildability firsthand. They need to see the details being implemented so they can improve upon them for their next project. Above all, they need to know that just having a 3D model of a building will not get a building built. Perhaps the younger generation are too deep into their coding and software tools to the detriment of much needed site experience. Actually, we need all of these experiences. As Ian Firth, the current president of the Institution of Structural Engineers said just last month, it is increasingly common for clients to engage structural engineers with a limited scope that does not include for any site supervision or inspection of the construction works. And there is often no clerk of works either. He was referring, in fact, to the Edinburgh Schools Report following the collapse of a wall at one school. He is concerned that the lack of site training is having a detrimental effect on the training of our younger generation. My colleague, Guilo Antonute, asked, will artificial intelligence redesign the designer here three years ago? So will you soon be calling me AI instead of an engineer? In engineering, the opportunities are massive for machine learning. Some think machines will design and build buildings without engineers. But I hope that I have given enough thoughts to suggest why I think that advancement is just one step too far at the moment and unacceptable to, general, to the general public without suitable checks and balances. I hope too that our clients appreciate the value of good engineering. But it is coming, AI. So what is it going to take to trust the outcome? If we were to ask Siri, design me a building, how do we make that acceptable? Well, artificial intelligence and machine learning can be used in a very valuable way. We are already trawling through our old projects to harvest the knowledge and to learn from our previous designs. Bill Gates once said, the first rule of any technology used in a business is that automation applied to an efficient process will magnify that efficiency. And the second is that the automation applied to an inefficient operation will magnify that inefficiency. Automation helps provide sanity to the outcome of our analysis. It is a tool, it is not the answer. Machine learning also offers us the chance to automate the mundane, to therefore open up the creativity that we love and the design flair that we love. It opens up the ability to put more effort into checking the outcomes of our analysis, both by human sanity check and by interrogation and comparison of those results what has happened on a previous project, for example. In this way, we can try and understand the proverbial black box. Because of this computer knows all approach, how can we know if the outcome is from a computer or a person these days? A stunning warm mural might make you think it was a Banksy, 
But did the artist have the skill, or was he simply uh, overlaying an image on his iPhone and tracing it? Are we relearning the art at the expense of fundamental skills? Now, automation is the key to our industry's productivity, as I'm sure you will recognize. The Economist ran an article last month about how the American construction industry lags behind other industries, citing much used McKinsey Global Institute statistics. And as you can see there, construction lags well behind. Now, I'll close with a Charles Darwin quote. It is not the strongest of the species that will survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. We should embrace the inevitability of technology and see disruption as an opportunity, yet to question every advancement. Thank you. Any questions? One question. Uh, what do you think about the gap about those who are working on the construction site, laborers, sometimes who are hired to lay bricks or mm -hmm. put partitions, yep. they can't even read the drawings, mm -hmm. and now as architect I can use scripting and parametric design. Mm -hmm. How can we educate those who okay. work and on labor site. on the construction site, mix sand with right. Concrete. Automation will play a large part in both the design end and the construction end. So robots on site will play a big part. That's with, with a, without a doubt. However, the use of the people on site is, is not going to change drastically in the next few years. So one, one way, and, and Scanser, for example, are trialling this at the moment. They, they have a, a, a helmet, a construction helmet um, from Dacry, and it has a, like a Google Glass image on it. And that enables them to call up um, the drawings in their little head-up display on their site helmet and allows them to, to look at what they're trying to build just within the confines of their, their, their personal space. So that sort of thing, I think, will become much more readily adaptable. Um, and Google Glass, you might remember from a few years ago, was probably a victim of its success in terms of the Maya principle. It wasn't acceptable at the time. But this Dacry helmet, D-A-Q-R-I, probably will be what kick-starts the industry in that way, I think. We, we live in a world with terrorist threats, cyber security, hacking all these systems. That worries me intensely that as an industry we haven't addressed that. Some, some malevolent uh, group is going to come in and start messing around with our software. So do we think as an industry we've got cyber security and protecting our software? We're in a collaborative world, BIM, we're sharing lots of information across different companies. What's your view on that? And for that very reason, a, another British standard was introduced last year, BS or PAS 1192 Part 5, which is all about security of that data, uh, aimed particularly at prisons and, and hospitals and so on that really need to, to make sure that data is secure. So uh, the industry is thinking about it, it has woken up to it. Um, it is a challenge, particularly given that more and more information is in the cloud. Who owns that? Where is it stored? Who can access it? We don't know. What if it goes offline? How are we going to be able to do our jobs? There are a number of things in the industry, um, and the, the use of the cloud, as it were, is an increasing and a, a, a juggernaut, if you like. It's not going to stop. So we will have to embrace it and then use these standards, for example, the PAS 1192 Part 5, to try and make sure that our designs comply. And in that way, I think we will, we will make good use of it. Going back to your reference to the cloud, and it's how terms are used, because actually the cloud is only a mainframe computer. I mean, that, that, it's actually mm -hmm. a throwback to the 60s where all of the work was done on a remote computer. Yes. And yet we're using terminology and words that seem to cloud mm -hmm. um, people's understanding of it. Now, is, yeah. there, is there danger in that? Mm -hmm. you know, yes. People try and hide Yeah, it's a gray cloud, um, if you like. And I think the, <laughs> also the. Um, the use of GPS is so embedded in modern systems. It's in, in, it's in mobile phone masks, for example. Without GPS, if that was turned off, we couldn't use mobiles, we couldn't uh, navigate a plane, couldn't launch a rocket and know where it's going to land, for example. Yeah. So I think there's a whole host of stuff that is interrelated in, uh, outside of the industry that will affect us. So it's not just where we put our data in the cloud. There's a whole lot more to it. Um, and I fundamentally think that GPS has its heyday, uh, but we need to find other ways of making more use of other technologies to bring about what we're trying to do on a, 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 a day by day. Um, and that includes how we d uh, deliver things using the cloud. Uh, I think there will be, there are many upstart companies, lots of um, 
new companies that are trying to embrace this with their different ways of working, pushing ways of working on us. So we just have to get to the bottom of which is the horse to back. Brian, you mentioned um, parametric design and computational analysis. At the moment, those tools allow an engineer to set the parameters within which the computer is going to operate and then produce an outcome for you. Yes. Is the engineer going to be more threatened in, in terms of its existence when the computer starts to set the parameters because it sees a better solution than you do? Well, I'll give you two thoughts on that. So parameters, there are... In, in to do a design, there are a number of parameters that are needed. We usually concentrate on a few of them, not all of them necessarily. That overcomplicates it. So ultimately, with computer power, we can look at more and more parameters to home in on, on an optimised solution. Um, and another thought on that is, is that if you look at robots and uh, automation, uh, take an example of a, a robot vacuum cleaner programmed to clean the floor. It's machine learning to clean the floor, just goes out and does its job. What if, with machine learning, it thinks, I need to kill the dog because that's the one causing the mess? <laughs> What's the next step to that? The, the children? <laughs> Did that answer your question? <laughs> Um, like you, Brian, um, I'm old enough to have set off on my first voyage before the Arab graduates of this year were even born. You put your 40 year gap up, but my observation of new technology industries is that the 40 year gap is the gap between when the founders were born and where they are now. Yes. And if they've got a 20 year gap, I'd be surprised. Yeah. Um, what do you think the implications of that are? for an industry where you very much work your way up, yeah. serve your time, mm -hmm. and the 40-year gap is, is really quite entrenched, I'd suggest. Yes, and I think that's where disruption rears its ugly head again, because there will be a number of companies where there'll be people that want to push an idea, but their power's being held back, and they then go and start up their, their own company, pushing that idea on the industry, whatever that industry is, and that's disruption. So that will play a major part in, in the longevity of some of the bigger companies. Uh, we all need to be adapt to change, and that's part, that's part of my, my thinking. So we need to embrace this, the change, the technologies, uh, and really look at how we manage a, a big company, any company, construction, any industry, uh, to, to try and plug that gap. We need to hear the voice of those people pushing new ideas, because they really do have valid ways of changing the industry, whatever industry, um, and we need to try and embrace that, I think. I suspect, yes if only because there is such a change in what, what's coming out of colleges and universities in terms of the graduates and what they're expecting. So their way of acting and coping and learning is, is requiring machines to do a lot of work. Now obviously with Graham's talk this morning that was very much about how the older generation and the younger generation are going to bring their ideas together. And I thought that was really, really interesting. They, the mention that of the over-dependence on, on some of the, the software and the machine learning side of things. But at the same time, we have to take those ideas on board because society wants us to do things faster, more efficiently, bringing projects on board much, much quicker. I, in my industry, I'm an external consultant, but I do a lot of work with the construction firms and with architects and with structural engineers and looking at how each one of them is having to respond to their clients is obviously moving things forward very, very fast. I, I really enjoyed Graham's pr presentation because we, in, the, in the studio we work very much physically with materials, working by hand, and then we take our experiments into, into the computer, creating digital models from them and, and, and to, to, to use how pow use the potential and the, how powerful these things are. But we try to keep sort of an open mind and try to come back um, into the reality and, and I think what Graham's presentation really made me think about is how to inspire young people who grow up with these amazing tools, um, to inspire them how to do things the old way, the traditional way, maybe that, that sort of hand way or the ca sort of um, calculation way um, because it's, um, I think it's really important that we keep this balance and we, we have the, the possibility to, to check on yeah, what's going on with all the computer stuff? <laughs>